All right, guys. So, uh, well, for today, you probably won't need the textbook. Here's what I'm uh, thinking. We spent 10 full weeks on financial markets. So, uh, instead of uh, waste another one or two hour on options, uh, I'll continue with more important stuff like financial institutions. And the last lecture, if by any chance, right, if there's a miracle, maybe, and I have time, I'll finish the options chapter. Now, only for today, what I'll do is something a little bit different. I'll be using this same financial institutions management. It's by the same authors, the Saunders and Cornett. What they have inside, because it's a financial institutions, they have a nice little chapter on introduction to financial institutions. Okay? So, uh, we got a... So, you can zoom out. Uh, so, basically, we got about 20, 25 minutes, and I'll try to make a typical two-hour chapter into 20 short minutes. So, chapter one is why financial institutions are special. So, we begin financial institutions. I've already discussed financial institutions in the first introductory lecture. If we have to separate them institutions in two categories, the two primary categories that makes a big difference is Depository, those like commercial banks which accept deposits, and non depository, those that don't accept, like investment banks. Depository will be credit union, it will be savings banks, okay? Non-depository will be insurance companies, brokerages, investment banks, and so on. All right, so, the first section is what makes financial institutions special? In other words, what's so tricky, what's so special about financial institutions? Number one is monitoring costs. Well, what is this? When a corporation issues bonds, okay, when a corporation issues bonds, sometimes somebody needs to basically monitor the corporation. For example, if somebody wants to take a loan, you gotta see who this person is that takes the loan. Do they have a job? Do they have an income? Do they have a business? Do they have assets? And all of those things. In general, whenever there is a lending, someone somehow has to see if the borrower is good to repay the loan. Well, the financial institutions, if you have a little bit of money and you try to lend to 20 or 50 people separately, you got to start watching these people, okay, what's happening. So, that's a lot of time, that's a lot of effort. Well, the financial institution will specialize in monitoring and watching people as they lend. They'll look at their incomes, their jobs, their other stuff. Same thing applies for corporations. If a corporation or business wants a business loan, 
the bank will be again monitoring basically means you observe and see what's going on you gotta keep up with the borrowers in general so that's number one number two will be liquidity when you lend money to somebody else for them to buy to get a business or to buy a house you might not be able to get your money back in 30 years so this uh, financial institution he uh, performs the function of liquidity where you put your money in the bank maybe a thousand people put their money in the bank and most of them will not need the money from the bank but then the bank will lend it to borrowers who may, let's say, buy a house. If you need your money, you can still go back to the bank and get some of your or all of your money back. The idea with financial institutions is that out of 100 customers, 95 will not need their money. But those five who happen to need them can actually go and take it. So financial institutions provide some liquidity to lenders. That's number two. And also, in general, for assets, whether it's stocks, bonds, whatever that might be, there is a price risk. You can buy an asset, a stock, the price can go down, take a loss. Uh, you can buy a bond, interest rate can go up, the price of the bond can down, go down, you can take a loss. Or, alternative, you can lend money to somebody that somebody might not pay you back, you can take a loss. In general, whenever you buy an asset, any asset, even a house, the price can go down and you can take a loss. Well, price risk is the risk that when you purchase an asset, the asset's price will go down and you'll take a loss, okay? Well, in that particular case, a commercial bank will take the price risk and when you put in your money as a deposit in the bank, you're guaranteed that supposedly you're going to get your, let's say, $1,000 back. So the financial institution will take the price risk. Otherwise, if you have a price risk, you might not even put the money in the bank, okay? You might just keep it in the mattress or not invest it at all. So, financial institutions uh, usually resolve these three problems, okay? They monitor the borrowers or the issuers of debt. They will give you the money back when you need them and they'll take or assume the price risk. All right, so I have here some uh, functions of financial institutions. Financial institution functions. First function is as brokers or brokerage functions. Brokers, same as brokerage. Uh, you want to buy a stock, they'll help you buy a stock. You want to buy a bond, they'll help you buy a bond. Or maybe precious metals, they'll help you with that. So, that's number one. Number two, they'll be doing investment research basically again they will specialize or have a professional who will be able to analyze different investments like stocks and will advise on what is a good investment, what is a bad investment. Based on their investment research, 
they will come as a result of the research with investment recommendations. That is, the financial institution will advise you to buy stock of Apple, stock of Facebook, okay, stock of whatever. What is that? Fangs. Fangs. You know what's a fang? You know, those teeth over here. Yes. Yes, no. Oh. Alright. We would say the four horsemen of NASDAQ is the fangs. Okay. Facebook, everybody knows. Apple, Netflix, and Google. Alright, so they'll be making recommendations. And of course, when they do all of these things, uh, in general, you or they enjoy what is known as economies of scale and specialization. You can't expect a doctor to understand, I mean, medical doctor, those that use knives to cut you open, right? Uh, to understand uh, different types of stocks or the differences between preferred stock and common stock, uh, dividends and all those things. Investments is a very hard, complicated field and the most difficult part is risk and risk management. And doctors aren't exactly good at managing investment risk. They can manage health risks, but not so well investment risk. So, brokers will specialize. They'll have possibly dozens, maybe hundreds of people doing the research and the recommendations, and then basically either selling it to people or whatever they do. Uh, based on these, uh, there will be a special type of institution. Uh, it's called a discount broker. Brokers and brokerages will generally do the research, they'll give you the recommendation, and then they'll help you buy or sell securities. You want uh, 20 shares of Apple or you want 10 shares of Google, right? You can buy them. A discount broker will provide only, it's called execution of the trade. All they're going to do is help you trade. You want to buy this stock? You buy this stock. You want to trade this stock? You want to sell this stock? You can sell this stock. They will not spend money on research. They will not do investment recommendation. It's just basic buying, basic selling. It's kind of like you go there uh, to exchange currency. They say uh, you give them dollars. They say you want euro, you want yen. It's entirely up to you. You decide what currency you want to get for it. It's your risk. They will not recommend, oh, we recommend you buy Norwegian kroner or Swedish kroner or Japanese yen. So that's a discount broker. They do execution and don't bother with research and recommendation. Number two, uh, financial institutions function, second function is as asset Transformers. Asset transformer. Uh, this means that they perform the function of asset transformation. Asset transformation means the following. Uh, you have one type of asset, let's say a bond, a 10-year bond, but you don't want to buy a 10-year bond. Maybe you'll need to buy, let's say, a motorcycle next year. So all you want to do is a three-month deposit. Okay. So they will, you will give them the money as a three-month deposit, and then they'll buy the 10-year 
So they will take up acid with 10 year of maturity and will slice the maturity for you. You want three month maturity, okay? You want six months maturity, okay? You want one year maturity, okay? And this guy wants a demand deposit. He wants to put the money in the bank unlimited, maybe a day, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year. But when he needs the money, he wants to be able to get it back. So this particular type of transformation which I explained so far is called maturity. Maturity transformation. They take securities from the market, whatever, let's say, corporations will issue five-year bonds, but will give you a maturity that you desire. Maybe three months, maybe one month deposit, okay? So that's maturity transformation. Well, the other thing, if you may remember from uh, the money markets is you want to buy a money market a particular instrument. If you remember the first key characteristics of money market instruments is they were a large denomination. $100,000 will be the smallest one and the typical instrument will be $1 million. Okay? Well, you, me, don't have a million dollar to buy a three month whatever security okay so what they will do is called denomination transformation denomination transformation meaning they'll take a security of one million dollars and slice it into thousand pieces of thousand dollars okay and you can invest thousand dollar slice piece okay and if I have let's say three thousand dollars I'll invest in three pieces one thousand dollars each and if I have twelve thousand you can invest in twelve thousand dollars so they'll take a one million dollar maturity and slice it into more smaller acceptable pieces kind of like if you got a pizza you're not going to devour the whole pizza they're going to cut it for you in 12 smaller slices okay and maybe will be shared between nine people for the pizza or six people or maybe three people okay or four people or one person will take two slices another person will take one another person will take five so that's the transformation function. They'll transform maturity, they'll transform denomination, and they'll do one other uh, piece. Uh, this is a lot trickier. Risk transformation. In other words, maybe they'll take a big risk and you as a depositor want to take a small risk. Of course, if you take a small risk, they'll give you 2% return and they, taking the risk, will get a 5% return. And if they got the risk right, they'll pocket the 3% difference. But if they got the risk wrong, they'll take the loss, respectively. Alright, well, number three is part of uh, Monitoring cost becomes information cost. Information costs. Uh, you have information asymmetry. Is it one or two S? I don't remember. Well, let's write it with asymmetry. I think it's one S. Basically, uh, sometimes, again, this means uh, the issuer of the bond knows something, but you as a lender 
don't know. So you don't know that they got problems with whatever, with their profits or with their product or with their legal stuff. Well, the bank, the mutual fund, the financial institution will collect information. So uh, instead of 1,000 people learning about this particular company, each separately lending to the company, the financial institution will learn about the company. So the financial institution will be saving on the costs. And by learning about the company, information asymmetry means the company knows certain things, but you don't know, or the financial institution don't know. So the financial institution, as it learns more and more about the company, will reduce the financial asymmetry in general. In other words, they'll get to know as much about the company as the company itself. It's possible that you have good experts in the financial institution that they will know more about the company than the company itself. That happens a lot with certain commodity companies. Let's say they produce oil. An oil expert might know a lot more about oil than the oil company itself. Oil companies doing oil, they make the oil, but the oil expert will know what's going on with oil in China and in Japan and of course with different types of oil alternatives and shale oils and so on. So expertise can help reduce this part. And what's called information is going to be imperfection. Sometimes information is not perfect. information sometimes not complete. You don't know anything and everything. Uh, another problem associated to information is called the agency problem. Uh, agency problem goes like this. Uh, your parents pay your tuition, right? I don't know, I'm just picking a number, random number, $3,000, could be 1000 could be five, doesn't matter. And they give you every day an allowance, let's say $10 allowance. This is money that you can use for, you know, uh, chocolate or Coca-Cola or coffee or water or whatever else you do, or maybe even eat, okay? So your parents pay your the tuition, they pay your living expenses, and they expect you to study, right? And if you study, you're doing your duty, your obligation. But you probably don't have to study. You can, you know, take your phone and play all day long Facebook and don't learn too much, okay? And then maybe cheat on the exam, right? So the example is called the principal agent. Principal is the one who pays the money and expects something to be done. And agent is the one who gets the money and is supposed to do something. Okay? So, for the corporation, the corporation says we're going to issue uh, $3 million of bonds or a loan either way and we're going to build a hotel and we're going to build a, let's say, 10-story hotel. But instead, they spend the money on jets and have fun and vacations. They buy a villa and all the other stuff. And then they build a hotel, but it's not a 10-story hotel. It's only a 5-story hotel. And then, when the money starts coming in from the hotel, it's not enough to service the loan. They can't pay you back, okay? Well, that's an example of an agency problem. They get the money and then they use it for something else. Well, the most common agency problem in, with corporations and businesses is managers. Managers are there to serve the stockholders. But managers take the money, the first thing they do is they buy up corporate jets, okay? Then they buy themselves a BMW. Seven series, you know, these executives they can't do a three series. That's you know not up to their standard. In other words, they won't buy a twenty thousand dollar car, they gotta buy a fifty thousand dollar car, right? Then they're gonna have a 
Retreat. Retreat means a nice place somewhere on the beach, okay, like Sahelville or wherever, or Pattaya in Thailand. And they're gonna have a nice villa for themselves, okay, with 10 servants. But they can't get the BMW 7 Series to go there. They'll go with an airplane, you know, they're gonna have a, their private jet. What's all they're saying is they're gonna be wasting shareholders' money and instead of this money going to the shareholders' return as a higher stock price or better as a higher dividend, the money is just wasted. Well, somebody's got to watch these managers not wasting the shareholders' money. It's kind of like somebody has got to watch you as a student that you're not wasting your parents' money. So the fundamental problem of information cost and agency is that somebody pays to someone else to get the job done and that someone else can either get a very good job or basically waste the money, okay, on what? fun, have fun in good time, and the, you need somebody to watch, which gets back to the monetary problem. That's number two. Let's see what else we got. Uh, well, that's number three. Number four, liquidity and price risk. So, number four, function number four, Again, a major part of financial institution is to absorb liquidity risk. In other words, if or when you need your money, the money will be there and you can take it. And when you put in $100, you expect with interest after six months to get 101 So if the value of the bond or the stock went down to 95 it's the bank's problem, not your problem. So the financial people want to have liquidity and they don't want to take the risk. Well, the financial institution will do that. Uh, one of the main ways is through diversification. In other words, they'll specialize, they'll do research, They'll have experts, but they'll diversify. They'll diversify in stocks, they'll diversify in bonds, they'll diversify in loans, okay? In commercial loans, and consumer loans, and real estate loans. So they'll try to diversify in as many ways as possible to reduce as much liquidity risk and price risk. They'll diversify their liabilities. For some people, they give demand deposits for other people one month deposit, for one other people three months deposit. The financial institution itself may issue five-year bonds and may issue ten-year bonds. So they'll try to diversify their liabilities too, not simply the assets. And let's see what else we got over here. Okay, well, how else they're special? Let's see how else they're special. Uh, camera on this side. And I'll be finishing very, very soon. Number one, they transmit monetary policy. It means the following. Financial institutions have a role in money supply. Money supply is determined by money and credit in the economy. Financial institutions, by generating or creating credit, will create money supply. So they have a role in the overall money supply and inflation. The second is called credit. allocation. They can allocate credit to consumers who buy cars, which is 
very unproductive. They can allocate uh, credit to mortgages, so people buy houses. That's again consumer consumption, very unproductive. Or they can give credit to build a factory, give credit to buy a machine, to buy equipment. So how they allocate credit, then the credit will determine if consumers are going, are going to be growing fat or the economy is going to be growing productive. In other words, it's going to be used for consumption or for production. Uh, next one is intergenerational wealth. Wealth transfer. That's very simple. When you're young, you save and you put it in the financial institution. Now, the financial institution doesn't have to be a deposit, could be a mutual fund. You buy stocks with it, okay? And then, when you're old, you basically, we save in English, you dis-save. This save basically means you draw on your savings, you consume your savings. So you accumulate savings in a financial institution, mutual fund, hedge fund, okay, uh, commercial bank, and then you take your money back as you get old. Uh, number four is very simple, very common sense, payment services. Payment services. Uh, you can do it in two ways, right? You know, the basic one here is, you know, I've heard wing. But a lot simpler is your parents are in some other town, you're here, uh, they got a bank branch over there, you got a bank branch over here, they'll just go and literally deposit money in your bank account there, and you can get your money over here. Or if I can, let's say, save some money and wire it from my bank here to my dad's bank over there back home in Bulgaria. And uh, I already mentioned it, denomination, it's got two names, denomination transformation. or denomination intermediation. Basically means they change the denomination from what the market offers, like one million dollar keynotes, and convert it to what consumers will find acceptable, like one thousand dollars. Okay, section number three is regulation. I skip completely section number three. And number four is modern trends. I don't need to cover. So, I've been able to cover a fairly large chapter as an introduction. Next time, I'll continue. You should be able in two hours to do uh, investment banking. Okay.